uh, Detective uh, uh, Murphy uh, on uh, July the 30th, uh, uh, you continue to question uh, Mr. Dahmer, and as a result of that, uh, you uh, wrote a narrative, correct? That's correct. Okay, can you tell us uh, what in that narrative is information that is not been told so far in the confession that is relevant concerning information you received from Mr. Dahmer? He was questioned regarding uh, questions that I had received from Bath, Ohio officers regarding disposal of the clothes and where he disposed of them. And also regarding the dog that he had hung in a tree in his earlier years, where it was. Basically, that's the same thing that he had told you before, that it was roadkill, that he uh, opened it up and, uh, and removed the inside and he hung it in a tree. Right, and he's also questioned regarding where he had thrown the knife he used in the homicide in Ohio and also the necklace that the victim had worn. And he told me he threw it in the Chioga River, which upon a search it was discovered. But he showed us where, the, showed me where, what location he threw it. And I was able to relay this information to Bath, Ohio. And then he once again, uh, you talked to him about him being stopped by the police. Was this information relative to that uh, first instance when he was stopped by the police uh, consistent with what he told you earlier? Right, it just went into a little more detail. Okay, can you tell us what more detail okay. there was, please? I question regarding the stop that happened in June of 1978 in Bath, Ohio, when he was stopped by the police when he had the bags of his first victim in the back of the car. He stated that the police stopped him around 3 a.m. in the morning. He was driving left of center. He stopped, he was detained for approximately one half hour, was given a test for drunken driving, is made to walk the line, do the finger to nose test, which he passed both of them. He was eventually given a ticket. He stated that when he was stopped, there was one car and one officer, but this officer apparently called for backup and another officer arrived. They asked him if he had been drinking, he stated he wasn't. They asked him how, did he, I asked him how he acted when the police stopped him. He stated he was very nervous, but he tried to act calm. I asked him if the police looked in his car and he stated yes with their flashlights. They asked him what the bags were in the back seat. He stated there were three bags in the back seat and he informed the police that it was garbage, that he had not had a chance to take to the landfill and he was going to do it tomorrow. I asked him if there was an odor coming from these bags and he stated in the bags that contained the body parts and he stated that there may have been a slight odor, he is not sure, but he believes he had the windows of the cars rolled up. I asked him what was the reason he told the officers that he was out driving around and he stated he told them that his parents were recently divorced and he couldn't sleep, so he just went out for a drive to get this off of his mind. I asked him if he was arrested previously and he stated to the best of his knowledge he had not been arrested prior to this stop and he subsequently received a ticket for driving left of center. I asked him what his intentions were with the three bags containing the body parts he stated he had intended to take them and throw them down the gully in the road. But when he got to that location, he was stopped by the police. Once he was issued the ticket, he made a U-turn, proceeded back to his residence, and placed the bags in the, of the bones and body parts in the drainage pipe behind his house. I asked him how long <clears throat> from the murder, or how long this was since the murder, he stated it was possibly the next day or so and he did this with the, with the intention of disposing of the, the body in this manner. But being that he was stopped, he left the bags in the drainage pipe for a week or two. Removed them subsequently, either broke them up with a large rock or a sludge hammer and disposed of them in the cliff in his yard. He stated that at the time the police were talking to him, he was near the side of his car. They made him walk to the rear where they performed the drunken driving tests and field sobriety tests, which he passed. He stated he could not recall the knife he used to cut up the body, only that it was possibly one from his house and he threw it in the river with the victim's necklace. 
I then contacted the Bath, Ohio Police Department and informed them of this interview. On the 30th again, did you continue to talk with them on that date? Yes. Tell us about that conversation, please. We questioned him regarding victim number one, who he stated died at the ambassador and related he met this individual about one week before Thanksgiving in 1987. He stated he rented a room at the ambassador and had previously prepared the sleeping pills in a glass by breaking the pills down to a powdery form and leaving this form in the glass. He stated that when he and the victim returned to the hotel, he made a rum and coke in this glass with the pills. He gave the strength to the individual and the individual subsequently passed out. Mr. Dahmer stated he also drank a lot and was lying in bed with this individual and he passed out. When he awoke, he discovered the victim dead and blood coming from the side of his mouth. He stated that he also noticed on the victim severe bruising on his chest and that he, Mr. Dahmer, had bruising on his forearms. So he surmised that he had beaten the victim about the chest, possibly killing him. After this occurred, Mr. Dahmer took the room for another night, proceeded to the Grand Avenue Mall where he purchased a large suitcase. He stated the suitcase had a zipper with a leather buckle going around the suitcase. He placed the victim in the suitcase and conveyed him to his grandmother's residence in a cab. Once at his grandmother's residence, he used a knife to dismember the body and he disposed of the body parts in the trash. He stated he did not use his grandmother's knife, but used one of his knives that he possibly bought at the mall. He is not sure, and he stated he also did dispose of the suitcase. We questioned him further regarding the use of sleeping pills, and he stated that in all the cases, he would have sleeping pills broken down into a powder form in the bottom of either a glass or a cup. And when he would prepare the drink for the individual, using either coffee, rum, or Coke, he would, use the glass or, he would use a glass or cup that contained the powdered sleeping pills substance. It would dissolve readily and the victim would be unable to determine anything was in his drink. This now, time the interview stopped. Now, um, let us go then on to the next time you had contact with him. It would have been on that same date. The next time was uh, the 31st. <clears throat> Tell us about that, yeah, Detective Kenny and myself questioned him regarding recent newspaper stories that stated as an eight-year-old boy in Ohio, he was sexually assaulted by a neighbor. To this, Mr. Dahmer stated it was untrue that the first time he experienced any sexual behavior as when he was approximately 14 years old, and that, with, that was with a young man who lived in the neighborhood. He stated that this individual was one or two years younger than him, and they mutually consented and got together on several occasions in a treehouse where they usually kissed and touched each other's body. We then questioned, questioned Mr. Dharma regarding a possible victim of his, that being a juvenile. We showed a family photo of this individual to Mr. Dahmer. And after viewing it, he stated that this in, fact, this, in fact, is the individual whom he had fought with in his apartment approximately July of 1980, uh, 90, July 8th, 1990. This was after a number of people had been killed, obviously. Yes. Tell us about that. Uh, he stated that the day previous to the fight with this individual, he had met this juvenile at the Phoenix Tavern and asked him to accompany him to his apartment. Can you tell us how old the juvenile was at the time of this incident? I believe he was 14. Well, his date of birth is uh, October oh. 74. So 90, 60. 16. He was 15 at the time. 15 going on 16. 15 going on 16. Thank you, continue on. As he said, he met him at the Phoenix Tavern and asked him to accompany him to his apartment for some homosexual activity and offered him money to pose for nude photos. He stated at this occasion, a juvenile readily accompanied him home to his apartment and they had no normal homosexual sex. He said they spoke of meeting again the following night at the Phoenix Bar. He stated that the juvenile left on his own accord that night. 
Mr. Dahmer stated the following night he went to the Phoenix Tavern on South 2nd Street where he again saw this individual. He stated at this time the juvenile again voluntary, voluntarily decided to return with him to his apartment and they took a taxi from the Phoenix to 23rd and Wells. And they got out, from, out there and walked. Mr. Dahmer stated he stopped, bought himself some cigarettes, and from there they walked to his apartment building. He stated the reason why he would have the taxi drop him off several blocks from his apartment was in order to keep the taxi driver from knowing exactly where he lived and to see if anyone had been following him as he did not want anyone to detect his activities. He stated after buying his cigarettes, they walked to his apartment and once inside they had conversation. However, he cannot recall what it was. He stated that at this time, he asked this individual if he would get undressed and allow him to take several photos of him in the nude. The ind individual complied. He had him lay on the bed and he took several photos. However, they did not come out. He asked the individual to turn on his stomach so he could take some back shots with his Polaroid, at which time he did. Mr. Dahmer stated that he started to become intoxicated and had run out of sleeping pills to put into this individual's rum and coffee potion in order to give, him, give it to the victim. He stated in preparation for this evening and knowing he was out of sleeping pills, he had gone to a hardware store and purchased a rubber mallet hammer. Now, what he was doing was telling you that he was running out of sleeping pills to give to his victims, whomever they might be. Right. Okay, and then because of that, he was trying to find a different way and he went out and got this this rubber mallet hammer. Right. Okay, now, at the time that you're talking to him about this young young man, did you know of that young man's identity or is this voluntary information from Mr. Dahmer about this incident? We knew his identity. Okay, okay. Continue on, please. He stated that he purchased this hammer because it was cheaper than filling his prescriptions, which cost approximately $30. He stated his intention was to strike the victim on the head with the hammer, to knock him out so that he would be able to strangle the victim while he was unconscious. He stated at this time the individual was lying on his stomach. He retrieved the hammer and struck the victim in the back part of his neck. He felt that by striking him in the back of the neck, it would cut off the blood going to his brain and cause the victim to pass out. However, this only made the victim angry and at this time they got into a physical fight and he stated that during the fight he tried to explain to this individual that he only struck him because he thought he was going to take his money, rob him and run out without giving him his photos. After fighting for a while on the front floor, the victim promised that he would not call the police and was allowed to leave the apartment. He stated the victim left the apartment, apparently went to the phone booth on the corner in order to call for a ride home, but after discovering that he had no cash, the victim returned to the apartment and knocked on the door. Mr. Dahmer opened the door, admitted the victim into his room, and they sat on his, in his bedroom and spoke about the incident all night. They both were on the bed sitting and talking. Yes. Okay. Mr. Dahmer stated there was no homosexual sex between them for the rest of the evening and he simply sat up all night discussing the fact that Mr. Dahmer had struck him with the hammer and whether or not this juvenile was going to report him to the police. Mr. Dahmer stated he felt comfortable that the talk he had with this individual regarding the entire incident had calmed down to the point where the individual was not going to complain to the police about him and early the next morning he allowed this individual to leave the apartment. He stated he does not recall seeing this individual again after this incident, and this is all the information he's able to give us regarding this. Was the information that he gave you consistent with any information you knew from any source, including in juvenile? Yes, it was relatively consistent did with you, what information did, we had. Did you tell Mr. Dahmer the allegations were made against him by this juvenile? before you started talking to him about the incident? Or did you ask him what happened in the incident and he told you? We asked him if he had ever had brought anyone to his apartment and had struck him with any type of instrument. 
and they subsequently were released and he informed us of this incident, right? And then, and then he told you about the episode. Right. You didn't tell him the information you had, you let him tell the story. That's correct. And the story that he told you substantially, the story that you had from another source? Yes. Okay, continue on, please. <clears throat> <clears throat> I think we're on page 84. Right, I'm some of the... We showed uh, Mr. Dahmer photographs of individuals regarding the other investigations and asked him questions whether or not he knew any of these missing people or were, were, was implicated or had any knowledge of any other homicides outside our jurisdiction, which he denied. Okay, but he, uh, you make note that uh, you asked him numerous questions regarding your investigation and he answered them freely. Yes. Okay. Then did you go into questions about his apartments and article used during the commission of the offenses? Right. We questioned him. We also received a call from Miami and we questioned him regarding... Well, but, my, but okay. oh, I'm sorry. Uh, anything to do relative to anything of substance in Miami? No. Okay. Yeah, and we then questioned him regarding his apartment and articles used during the commission of the offenses. And he stated that he used drill bits to drill holes in the heads to flush them out. And these drill bits should be in a box or they were in a box in his apartment and they were on his floor. The police, he stated the police should have had recovered these, uh, these items because they were in his apartment at the time he was arrested. He also stated that the spray paint that he used, which was a fake granite type bluish color, should have a pamphlet in one of his drawers in the residence. He does not recall the brand name, but the can was light complected. He again stated he bought this at Pallet's Art Shop on Water Street. This was checked out by another detective. Regarding the makeup, he used the color of the genitals that he kept of one of the victims. He stated he bought the skin tone type makeup at a store in Southridge that was, it was a specialized makeup that was used for hiding marks or discolored skin. He stated the reason he colored this was because he wanted it to be more of a flesh color. We then asked him questions regarding where he had gone on vacation. He stated the only vacation was in 1976 when he went with the family to Puerto Rico for a two week vacation. We, he also stated that during all the initial meetings with his victims, he all, always offered money for sex, taking photos, watching videos, or a combination of these. But he stated it was not for heavy sex, he just hoped it would lead to that. We questioned him again regarding some of the victims, and he stated one of the victims, namely Ed Smith, who was a bald-headed guy, victim number six, and we asked him if he knew this individual by nickname of Sheik. He stated he did not know his real nickname. He did not know his real name nor his nickname, but this individual did wear a headband like an Arab type headband. He stated he did take photographs, but he tore them up and threw them out. He stated that most of the homicides took place either on weekends or when he had time off from work. He also stated he does not drive a car, never owned a car in Wisconsin and that he accepted rides home from, from factory workers a couple of times from his supervisors, but he never used his car or anyone else's while in Wisconsin. <clears throat> Mr. Dahmer again at this time stated that he was not involved in any other homicides and that if he can recall any information, he would help us in our investigation. He would either contact myself or Detective Kennedy with this information. Mr. Dahmer had in his possession at that time a book he had received in the mail from the Vanity Fair magazine. This book was titled Killing for Company by Brian McMasters. This book depicted a case of a suspect, Dennis Nielsen, who would kill people, dismember them, and throw them in plastic bags and dispose of them. This case is possibly similar to Mr. Dahmer's and the magazine requested an interview from him. This information was given to his attorney in our presence and she kept a copy of the book. As it relates to that, did not Mr. Dahmer indicate to you that he'd never read nor heard of anything relative to this, Mr. Nielsen? That's correct. And you know for a fact that he did not talk to Vanity Fair, don't you? That's correct. Okay, continue on. At this time we set up an appointment to obtain an order produced for August 1st to meet 
at the CIB with Mr. Dahmer, his attorney, Wendy Patricus, and show him additional photos that we expected to arrive of possible other victims. The next time you met with him was on the same day, was it? Right. Uh, there was some discussions about um, matters re re relating to periods of time he might have been in Germany. Yes, there was. Whether or not he knew anything about German, spoke it, etc. right? That's correct. Then there was more talk again about who he was stationed with, etc. in his military career. Yes. Did you learn anything from that interview that you did not already know? Just, we just went through his basic uh, uh, lifestyle and pattern from when he was born, when he went to school. So you were doing a chronology of his life. Right, his and timeline going into his life for a while. This was capsulizing what you had already been told in one new session with him that was consistent with what he had told you earlier. Yes. Okay. Um, and page uh, 87, um, He starts talking to you about his um, fantasy, <coughs> and he tells you something about his interests in women and juveniles. You see that towards the bottom of page 87. After he left Germany. Right. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. What's he say relative to that? Um, his question regarding the activities in Germany he stated that he didn't have any relatives living in Germany, and then he stated that he has been a homosexual all his life. He stated he is not interested in women or not intentionally in juveniles, and he stated the age group he part participated with homosexuals ranged from late teens, 18, 19, to the middle to early 20s. He stated if the individual is younger but looks older, he will attempt to have a relationship with him. In regards to the number of victims in the United States that Mr. Dahmer admits to killing 17 people. Of these, one is out of Wisconsin, Bath, Ohio, his first victim in 78. And the other victims were all in the Milwaukee County area. Yeah. Now in that regard, the next thing that you do is you go through again a list of when he did his homicides in what year, and that's already been made known to the jury by dates, and that's yes. substantially true and correct, right? Yes. Okay, so there's no sense of having to repeat them. But what was shown to the jury as to these names of the people and the dates of their death is consistent with what he told you at this interview? That's correct. Okay. Now what did he say as far as sexual preference, etc., concerning these people? As far as a sexual preference, he says race, religion, or education of the individual that the suspect preferred. The suspect stated that it was not a matter of race, religion, or education. It was just a matter of opportunity. He stated that he offered each one of these individuals money to be photographed, to view videos, or to have sex. And after he persuaded them to come to his apartment, he would give them a sleeping potion. And once they went to sleep, he would strangle them either manually or with a strap photograph most of them after death, sometimes have sex with them after death, and subsequently dismember them. Dismember them. And uh, apparently 11 of his victims kept the skulls and approximately four torsos, the hands, a couple hearts, and other inner organs. Now in that regard, didn't he, did the body uh, framework of these victims, were they pretty much uh, within what Mr. Dahmer told you he was interested in? Yes. And also, physique-wise, they were pretty much all about the same physique style. Yes. So you know of nothing that uh, you knew that contradicted what he said his interest was. And uh, did you accept the fact, uh, as you had testified to yesterday and have read again here today, that these were not uh, killings uh, of a sexual preference nature or any hatred for any person because of race, color, creed, or sexual preference? That's correct. You were satisfied he was telling you the truth? Yes. And, and it is true, is it not, that almost all of these victims were about the same physique, the same physical makeup? Yes, some were a little more muscular, but they all had basically what he had desired. Okay. We now are uh, going into uh, the date of the 31st of July. Is that accurate on page 90? 
Yes, it is. Okay, would you tell us uh, about that that interview? That's a Wednesday now. This is a week and two days after he is, uh, actually it's a week and one day after he's arrested, correct? Yes. Okay, tell us what he tells you at that time. We asked him whether or not he'd be willing to answer some questions regarding the last offense, namely the attempt homicide, which led to his arrest. Mr. Dahmer stated he did not need his attorney present, that he, will, he has cooperated with us fully and will continue to cooperate with us. He wished to tell us about the, what he recalls of this incident. Please tell us. Mr. Dahmer stated that about a week prior to this offense, which had occurred on July 22, 1991, he met the subject, Tracy Edwards, at the bus stop in front of the Eagles Club on 24th in Wisconsin. Mr. Dahmer stated that he was sitting there drinking a beer and thinking when the victim asked Mr. Dahmer for a cigarette. There was some small talk and the victim got on the bus. Mr. Dahmer stated about a week later, he was having pizza, actually 7-22-91. He was having pizza at the Grand, pizza and beer at the Grand Avenue Mall. After finishing this, he walked down the third street front entrance of the mall and he saw the victim and two of his friends, the victim meaning Tracy Edwards. He stated that he approached them and they had small talk and this was about 5 or 6 p.m. He then asked the victim if he wanted to make approximately 50 to $75 to go home with him so that he can take some pictures of him and watch some videos. He indicated the victim then went over and talked to his friends and they agreed to go to his apartment. He stated they all walked over to the liquor store, the victim and both of his friends, which is on 6th in Wisconsin. He then went into the liquor store, bought a bottle of rum and Coke, and believe, he believes a six pack of beer. Related that as he walked out, the victim's two friends were gone, so he and the victim proceeded to the Greyhound bus station where they took a taxi. He got, the ta got out of the taxi in front of the Eagles Club on 24th in Wisconsin, so that nobody would know where he lived, and they walked to his residence. He indicated they walked through the back door because that's the way he always goes. It's the door closest to his apartment. He stated once he got into the apartment, he made a drink of rum and coke, and he did not have any sleeping pills left, so it was just rum and coke. He stated they were sitting there drinking, sitting there drinking and talking about going to gay bars in Chicago, and he started watching videos, namely Exorcist 2. Then started talking about taking some pictures, namely bondage pictures. He told the victim that he wanted to handcuff him. He stated he got the first handcuff on him and as they were sitting on the edge of the bed in the bedroom. Mr. Dahmer stated that then things began to get fuzzy and he does not remember having a knife or putting a knife up to the victim. He stated he must have blacked out. He also stated that he does not remember telling the victim anything about showing him things that he would not believe. Well, let me just interject at this time. At this time, you have a <coughs> statement from Tracy Edwards. Yes, we do. And you are asking him questions and telling him some of the things that Tracy Edwards said. Yes. And he is responding to that when he said he doesn't know anything about showing him things or that things that Tracy Edwards would not believe. He, didn't, he said he didn't remember saying that. That's correct. But that's based upon information you received from Tracy Edwards. Yes. Okay, continue on please. Mr. Dahmer stated that he recalled hearing a knock at the door, which he answered. He observed two police officers along with the victim standing in the hallway. He related that he invited them in and the victim still had the handcuff on his wrist. The next thing he can recall is that one of the police officers went into the bedroom and when he heard him say cuff him, at which time the other officer placed handcuffs on Mr. Dahmer. He indicated that he then placed, he indicated when he placed the handcuffs on him, he began to struggle. He stated he continued to struggle even when the officers opened the refrigerator door. I asked Mr. Dahmer whether or not he told the officers where the handcuff key was because the officers could not remove the cuffs. And he stated he might have said that it was in the bedroom, but he doesn't remember. And the reason you asked him that is because one of the police officers told you that Mr. Dahmer told him that the cuff was in the bedroom. Yes. I mean, the key was in the bedroom. The key was in the bedroom. But then when you asked him about that, he said he doesn't remember. He might have, but he doesn't remember saying it. Yes. Okay, continue it. He also related that he didn't remember showing any photos to the victim, nor does he rem remember threatening the victim with a knife. He did state that the reason he uses handcuffs is so that he can keep control of his victims. He stated that he keeps the knife in the bedroom. 
Mr. Dharma was asked if he remembered stating anything to the victim about threatening him or about cutting his heart out, and he stated he does not recall doing this. But he's not denying it. He's just saying he doesn't recall doing it because of his condition. That's correct. But he isn't saying it didn't take place. That's right. Okay, continue. Mr. Dharma was asked why he fought with the police, and he stated it was probably because he did not want to be arrested and that he did not want them to see what was in the refrigerator. Mr. Dahmer stated he cannot recall anything regarding this due to the fact that he had been drinking and he thought he was intoxicated. Let me ask you, did any police officers or Tracy Edwards tell the Milwaukee Police Department that in fact Mr. Dahmer was intoxicated? Not that I know of. The officers who said him never made a report that said he was intoxicated? No. Did you ask Mr. Dahmer about that? that you thought you were intoxicated, the officer says you weren't. Did you ask him to explain that further? Yeah, he said he didn't remember, it was fuzzy. Okay, thank you. Continue on, please. Mr. Dahmer did recall when the police arrived, but stated he does not recall the victim leaving, nor does he know when the victim left his apartment. We then asked him where the handcuff key was, and he stated that he threw the handcuffs and keys, key in the garbage earlier and retrieved the handcuffs and not the key. He states he would have been unable to remove the cuffs if he had placed them on the victim unless he removed the hands of the victim. Did that conclude the interview concerning the incident with Mr. Tracy Edwards? Yes. Okay. What is the next thing that uh, occurred uh, relative to Mr. Edwards on that day? Was that the end of uh, working with him on that day? Yes, it was. Next time you saw him was on uh, August the 1st, is that right? Yes. Tell us about what happened on that day. Uh, we again obtained an order to produce from the county jail and escorted Mr. Dahmer over to the Criminal Investigation Bureau, where we were met by his attorney, Wendy Patricus, Wendy Patricus, and in the interview room, interview room, and we talked to him regarding activities in Bath, Ohio, specifically the location where he had disposed of the knife. I had received a faxed copy of a map of the sewage treatment plant area and showing the bridges where he had, Mr. Dahmer had previously indicated where he had disposed the knife and he placed an X in the area where he thought the knife would be. This was then sent back to Bath so they could assist in their search of the river. We then asked him several questions regarding the homicide scene and as to whether or not he had broken the knife he used and dropped it where the bones were recovered, which he stated he did not. We asked him if his parents knew anything about the homicide or any of the other homicides that he stated that they did not know anything regarding his activities. We also informed him that pruning shears were found at the location where the bones were, were discovered in Bath, Ohio. And he stated he did not use pruning shears, nor does he know anything about it. We also informed him that there was a toolbox recovered in the crawl space under his house in Bath, Ohio and he did not have any knowledge of this. This information was passed on to the Bath, Ohio Police Department. In the course of your investigation, there was a lot of people and a lot of inquiries as to whether or not Mr. Dahmer might have been responsible for unsolved homicides, correct? Yes, there was. And those matters were discussed with Mr. Dahmer? Yes, they were. And he, he denied them? That's correct. And, and he, even though he was asked about him and deny him, uh, that information is part of the records as to what he was asked about and who he was asked about, correct? Yes. Okay, but for the purposes of our discussion here this morning, since there's been no independent evidence that he was lying to you about those, we'll just continue on as to the homicides that we're talking about, right? That's correct. So that would take uh, us up to page 95. Yes. Does Mr. Dahmer at some time want to rediscuss with you <clears throat> the incident concerning the juvenile, the one that got away? Yes. Okay, and would you tell us that takes place on the on, on the uh, August the 1st, is it? Yes, it is. Okay, tell us what, what he wants. Does he, does he want to tell you he wants to talk about it? Yeah, he stated he wished to speak, uh, speak to us again regarding his relationship with a juvenile that he had struck with a rubber mallet. Did he tell you why he wanted to talk to you about it? He had forgotten to mention facts regarding this relationship. 
Okay. He stated that he had seen this individual. I got to stop you for a moment. Oh. I meant to ask you a question about Tracy Edwards. There was no homosexual conduct at all between Mr. Dahmer and, and Tracy Edwards. Correct? No, he did not mention any. Right? Neither side. Right. Neither Mr. Dahmer nor Mr. Edwards, right? Right. Okay. Please continue on where you were. Mr. Dahmer stated that he had seen this juvenile working at the 219 Club as a cleanup helper for some time before he actually got to know him. He observed this individual cleaning up glasses, sweeping up floors in the tavern several times late in the evening. First time he met this individual was in a Phoenix Tavern. He found him attractive, so he approached him and offered him $200 to return to his to return with him to his apartment to pose nude for some pictures and to have some homosexual sex. He stated they took a cab to his apartment on North 25th Street where they mutually consented to engaging in sexual activity, which involved kissing, masturbation, and oral sex. He stated he also took several pictures of this juvenile. However, he did not like the way they turned out, so he tore them up and threw them away. He indicated that this juvenile willingly spent the night with him on that evening, and before leaving the morning, he advised the juvenile that he would meet him at 12 o'clock the next day and would, in fact, give him the money for the previous night's activities. They agreed to meet at 12 o'clock. Mr. Dahmer took this to mean 12 noon and decided he would, in fact, meet this individual, make this individual one of his victims. He stated at this time he was out of sleeping pills, which he had used on previous occasions to knock out his victims. He did not have the $30 to fill, refill his prescription. So early in the morning, he went to the Army Navy surplus store on Wisconsin Avenue where he purchased a plastic hammer. He stated he brought this hammer and planned to use it to strike the juvenile on the head in order to render him unconscious so they could strangle him and make him one of his victims. He related he returned to the Phoenix bar about 12 noon, however, this juvenile was not there. So he went about his business for the day. See, so later on in the evening, he returned to the gay area on South 2nd Street, and upon BART closing time at approximately 2.30 a.m., he again saw the juvenile standing inside the Phoenix Tavern. This time, the juvenile again agreed to accompany him back to his apartment, and he took a cab. He stated at once at the apartment, he again engaged in sex, which involved kissing, masturbation, and oral sex. Mr. Dahmer informed this juvenile he wished to take a few pictures of him in the bedroom. It was, this, it was during this picture-taking section when the juvenile was lying on his face with his back and head exposed on the bed of Mr. Dahmer that he took the plastic hammer and struck him in the back of the neck in an attempt to render him unconscious. Mr. Dahmer stated upon striking this individual, he became angry and got up, at which time a small argument ensued. He stated the reason he struck this, he told the individual the reason he struck him was because he felt he was going to take his $200 and leave without spending the night. This in juvenile did not buy that explanation, and he left stating that he was going to call the police. Let me, let me just stop you there for a moment. Did he know this person by name? <clears throat> he did not recall his name. Okay, continue on. Mr. Dahmer stated this individual left the apartment and the apartment building. However, approximately 10 minutes later, he heard pounding on the outside outer apartment lobby door, and we went to investigate this individual was standing there requesting to get back in and asking for money. Mr. Dahmer at this time stated the individual followed him back into his apartment and once inside, Mr. Dahmer grabbed him by the neck and attempted to strangle him in a fight ensued. He related they fought for a couple minutes, then Mr. Dahmer simply stopped fighting and decided to calm the situation down by stating let's talk. He stated that this juvenile agreed, although he was highly aggravated, and they went into the bedroom area where they sat down. Mr. Dahmer stated after calming him down, he asked this individual if he would in fact allow him to tie his hands behind his back, and the juvenile agreed. Mr. Dahmer stated he tied this individual's hands behind his back, however not very tight, and they continued to talk. He indicated that during the next half hour or so, this individual wiggled free from the extension cord he had tied on his hands and attempted to leave the apartment, at which time Mr. Dahmer grabbed him, grabbed his six-inch bladed knife, plastic handle, and he believes the individual thought this was a gun and decided to sit down again. 
He related they began to talk and talked approximately until 7 a.m., at which time Mr. Dahmer stated during the talk he was trying to convince this individual not to tell the police about the night's activities, and he continued to apologize for striking him with the hammer. Mr. Dahmer stated that although he did intend to kill this individual and make him one of his victims, and because of the previous night's sexual activity and the fact that they had spent hours talking, he began to sober up and know this individual on a more personal level and had decided he would not kill him. He indicated that at approximately 7 a.m. in the morning, he walked this individual to the bus stop on 24th in Wisconsin and gave him money for cab fare. He indicated that this was the last time he saw this individual until about five or six months later as he was walking in the Grand Avenue Mall. He observed him walking in the mall as well. He stated this individual approached him and said hi. He related that there was no further conversation, but approximately March of 91, as Mr. Dahmer was again sitting in the mall eating ice cream, this individual observed him, walked up to him, and initiated a conversation. He stated they had small talk for a while, and then they both went their separate ways. Let me ask you a question. Um, did this uh, juvenile report this matter to the police? Yes, he did. Was there a formal report made on it? Yes, there was. Is his recantation of what happened substantially the same as Mr. Dahmer's uh, statement as to what happened? There's some similarities, yes. Uh, did um, you ask uh, Mr. Dahmer why it was that he let this young man go and not kill him, uh, whereas he didn't uh, let others go? that he brought up for actually and basically the same reason? Yes, he's, he said he developed a more personal relationship. He sobered up and decided he wouldn't kill him. But he also indicated and stressed that he got to know him on a more personal level. Yes. And he let him go. Yes. Okay. When's the next time you talk to Mr. Dahmer relative to these matters? Friday, August 16th. Friday, August 16th? Yes. Okay. Um, let me ask you, let me just state for the record, Your Honor, and, and counsel for the state, and I have discussed this, that on October the 2nd, as part of the exhibit that has been marked and received, specifically pages 113 through 120, is a narrative uh, formulation by Detective Murphy as to identifying matters relative to all of the victims that had been the object of Mr. Dahmer's conduct. Uh, since all of this has been testified to in one fashion or another, uh, this is a culmination of many reports wherein he recites information concerning each and every one of the victims. And since it's nothing new that hasn't already been read, I will not take the time to read it now, but it will be part of the exhibit. Sir, no. that's, that's correct with the one correction that I believe this is August the 2nd. Said oh, I'm sorry, August the 2nd. And that's uh, pages 113 through 120. It would just be completely repetitious. Now, uh, would you tell us uh, whether or not um, <coughs> you talked to him on uh, August the, the, the 5th concerning uh, any matters? Uh, on August 5th, uh, and any other interviews until August 16th were conducted by Detective Kennedy with Detective James DeVolcanier due to the fact that I was not around well, at the time. If you don't have any objection, I don't. I'd like to have him read them unless you want me to bring them to the Absolutely no problem. Why don't you read then, uh, continue on reading what your co-workers uh, co and co-officers uh, put down in their reports relative to the matters that we're talking about, okay? Okay. I mean, you know these to be substantially true and correct, do you not? That's correct. Okay, so in official police reports? Yes. Okay, go ahead. On August 5th, uh, Detective Kenny and DeVolcanier questioned him regarding other missings or other homicide victims from other jurisdictions on page 121. How about 122 and 123? 122, they began to question him regarding victims from Milwaukee, at which time um, 
Mr. Dahmer was showed a family photograph regarding possible victim, that being Stephen Tume, T-U-O-M-I. Mr. Dahmer viewed the photograph and positively identified him as being the individual who he first murdered in Milwaukee at the Ambassador Hotel. Um, Detective DeValconeer filed a supplementary report regarding this identification. He stated at this time he thought it's going to take more than this to make me stumble. That's a quote of his. It's going That's to take quote. more than that to make me stumble. As he was continually, continually fighting his homosexual urges. However, he stated that it was shortly after this incident in the library that he been, again began frequenting gay bookstores, gay bars, gay baths, and he feels that this was a catalyst which started him again into his homosexual lifestyle, which eventually led to his killing and dismembering of victims. He then is met by the department's people again, uh, Detective uh, Kennedy and, how do you pronounce it, DeValconeer. De and they want to talk to him about Mr. Tuomi. <clears throat> yes. Tell us what was said. Um, Mr. Dahmer viewed the photos which had been received of Stephen Tuomi, and he positively identified this as being the person that he had encountered in November of 1987. These photographs were obtained from the family. Mr. Dahmer related that at the time he had been in front of the 219 Club at Tavern on South 2nd Street at about closing time. He encountered Mr. Tuomi while he was waiting at a bus stop. He had already obtained his hotel room at the Ambassador, which he believes is located on 24th in Wisconsin. He'd gotten the room earlier with the plan that if he had encountered someone, he would take them there for the purpose of having sex with them. He had already purchased some sleeping pills which he had at the room for the purpose of rendering anyone he brought back there helpless so he could have sex with them. He spoke with Tuomi and asked him if he wanted to spend the night with him at the hotel room. Tuomi agreed. Dahmer does not recall if he offered him money to come to the room or not. Upon arrival at the hotel, both Dahmer and Tuomi got undressed and laid on the bed. At that time, they, they had what Mr. Dahmer called light sex. He described this as hugging, kissing, and mutual masturbation. After about an hour or two, Mr. Dahmer made a drink for Mr. Tuomi at which he put the sleeping pills. Mr. Tuomi drank this, fell asleep, and Mr. Dahmer kept drinking and eventually fell asleep himself. Mr. Dahmer related that when he woke up, he was lying on top of Mr. Tuomi and Dahmer's forearms were visibly bruised. He saw that Mr. Tuomi was obviously dead. He was bleeding from the head, and his chest was crushed in, and some of the bones were broken. At this time, Mr. Dahmer carried Mr. Tomey and placed him in the closet in the hotel room. He sat around the hotel room for a couple hours trying to figure out what to do. At about noon, he went to the Grand Avenue Mall, bought a large suitcase with wheels on it, and returned to the Ambassador Hotel. During that time, he may have had some beers, and he left the hotel room to get a bite to eat. At about 5 p.m., he returned to the hotel room, placed Mr. Tuomi in a large suitcase. He related that it was very tight fit, but he was able to get him into the suitcase. He said that he purchased a room for another night and remained in the room until about 1 a.m. That time, he left the room with the suitcase, taking an elevator to the ground floor. He got a cab, and upon approaching the cab, had the driver help him place the suitcase in the back seat of the cab. He then took the cab to his grandmother's house on South 57th Street. Upon arrival at the grandmother's house, Mr. Dami put the suitcase in the <coughs> fruit cellar in the basement. He left the suitcase there for about a week. He said he did this because it was Thanksgiving time and it was cold in the basement, and he knew this would slow the decomposition of the body. After about a week, he got the suitcase out of the fruit cellar and removed the body from it. After removing the body from the suitcase, he used a knife to open the body and then stripped the flesh from it, placed the flesh in plastic bags. He then used the old sheet which had been in the basement to wrap the bones. He then crushed the bones with a sledgehammer. He related that he wrapped the bones in the sheet so that the, when he was crushing them, the splinters and fragments of bones would not fly all over the basement. He then put these items in the trash. Regarding the Ambassador Hotel, Mr. Dahmer related that on four or five previous occasions to his encounter with Mr. Tuomi, he had rented a room for the purpose of having sex with someone he would meet. 
he indicated at no previous times had he killed anyone there and nothing had happened. They then received information from Bath, Ohio regarding a receipt they had recovered indicating that Mr. Dahmer had purchased a gun. When was that gun supposedly purchased, Jerry? On January 23rd, 1982. 82? Yes. Okay. He was questioned regarding his ownership and Mr. Dahmer related that while working at the Plasma Center, he had purchased a 357 snub nose revolver. He thinks he bought the gun in 82 or 83. He related that he only owned this gun for about one year and used it for target shooting at the range. He bought the gun at the gun shop in the area of 83rd and Lincoln. He paid $350 for it. He did not remember the cost of using a range. He was then showed a fax copy of the receipt for the purchase of the gun bearing his signature and he identified this copy and receipt and say that this is, he received this when he bought the gun and the signature of the, on the receipt was in fact his. He stated when his grandmother found out he had a gun in the house, she did not like it. He showed her the gun shortly after that. His father visited from Ohio and his grandmother told his father that he had a gun and his father took the gun from him. Mr. Dahmer believes that his father took the gun back to Ohio and sold it. Mr. Dahmer related he only bought the gun because he had enjoyed shooting while he was in the military and felt that it was something he might like to do. He related that he never owned a gun in previous interviews because he did not feel the gun had any connection with any of the victims in the homicides which he was being talked to about. He stated he never used a gun for anything other than target practice. So because he never used a gun, he, he was telling you that he didn't try to lie to anyone. It just never was involved in anything he was doing anyway. That's correct. And he didn't have it for very long anyway. That's correct. Continue on, please. The next uh, thing that Mr. Uh, Dahmer had a discussion with was some information concerning a relationship that he had with a, a lady, a young lady in, in Miami. Miami, right. Correct? Yes. Tell us about the reason that was discussed and what, if anything, did you learn from that? We received information from Bath, Ohio Police Department that while he was living in Miami, he in fact had a girlfriend who lived with him and he had intended on, to marry. To this, Mr. Dahmer stated that he was in Miami, he was working at the submarine shop called the Sunshine Sub Submarines. He met another employee there. He stated it was a white woman with long, curly, thick black hair, and she was originally from England. He said she was in this country illegally, and they had become friends. He states he is unsure, but he thinks her name was Julie. He states he did not go, he did go out to dinner with her several times and talk along the beach and walk along the beach. However, at no time he had, he had any inclination for sexual activity with her. He never felt attracted to her in that way. He states they were mainly friends. He indicates, he goes on to indicate that many times she advised him that she would be willing to marry an American as a marriage of convenience in order for her to obtain her naturalization citizenship. He states to the best of his recollection, she was attracted to the manager of the submarine shop. However, she did mention to Mr. Dahmer several times that she would be willing to marry him in a marriage of convenience if he would help her become a citizen. He states they did talk about that several times. However, he never, in fact, took it seriously. And because he was not interested in her sexually or as a lifetime partner, he never actually encouraged this conversation. He states after moving back to Ohio, he believes that she did either call him once or twice or write him a letter. However, he did not respond. As he had stated previously, he was not interested in pursuing a relationship with her. He denies that any time he considered her a girlfriend or had any relationship with her other than a work relationship. And he also denies that she ever lived with him in any of the motels that he was staying while in Miami. Did you ever have any information relative to Mr. Dahmer's sexual preference other than what he told you to be? I mean, did you ever learn that there was, there was he wasn't telling you the truth about that? No, he stated he was a homosexual. And that's all your information was, is that was consistent with the facts as you found them out? That's correct. Now, he had another relative living in, in, the, in the Milwaukee area, uh, and... Uh, 
uh, he told you about uh, how that uh, relative had uh, 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 come across some information concerning odors in his, the grandmother's house and things of that nature? Yes. What would he tell people, uh, including his relatives and his grandmother, as to what the odors that were discovered and reported out, uh, what, what, they, uh, what those odors were from? Uh, his aunt had told his grandmother and father about the smells, and he states that he told his grandmother and the aunt that the smell was because of the cat that, that the grandma had by the name of Jody had filed the kitty litter box, which was located in the basement and had not previously been emptied. He stated at one time his aunt pressed him further, stating that it was not kitty litter smell. And at this time he made up a ploy story stating that he had found a dead raccoon and had cut up the raccoon in the basement in order to save the bones. He stated he told this because he realized there was a smell of dismembered bodies that came from the basement. This time he was asked how, he, how this could be and he stated that because several of his victims, although he cut them up and dismembered them over the drain pipe in the basement, he states after hosing down the basement floor and washing down the blood down the drain, he was careful that none of the body parts or chunks of flesh got into the drain. He states after disposing of the body parts and the bones and hosing down the blood, he would pour a full gallon bottle of bleach down the drain in order to try to get rid of the smell but the dismembered bodies would give off an awful odor and it would linger in the basement for one or two days before it would go away. He states this is a smell that his aunt smelled and she was the one that brought up the foul smell to his grandmother and to his father. However, he was usually able to dissuade them from investigating further by his explanations of the raccoon and the kitty litter box. At this time, a photo array of several individuals that may have been the second victim who was still unidentified was shown and after viewing all these photos he stated that none of the photos shown to him resembled the victim that he in fact killed at his grandmother's house. There, there came a time when uh, the Milwaukee Police Department was interested in discussing uh, some movies that were found uh, in Mr. Dahmer's apartment, correct? Yes. And that interview was conducted by Detective uh, Kennedy. Yes. Tell us what was uh, learned as a result of that. What uh, was asked of Mr. Dahmer and how did he respond? Uh, Mr. Dahmer started to talk about a movie which was found in his apartment, that being The Exorcist Two. Now, it, it, for the sake of the record, is it not that it was really a movie called Exorcist Three? Or don't you know? I'm not sure. Okay. Continue on. Say it the way it's written and then okay. we can correct it later. I asked him at this time why he in fact purchased Exorcist 2 and he stated that he had seen the movie when it first was first released and that he was fascinated by it. He stated he enjoyed the movie so much that when it was first released on video cassette, he spent approximately $100 to purchase a copy of it. I asked him what f fascination was with the movie to which he stated he was unsure but he knows he felt a tremendous amount of guilt because of his actions. He stated he felt evil and thoroughly corrupt body and soul because of the horrible crimes he had committed against people. He stated that every time he would try to overcome his feelings of wanting to kill and dismember people, they would haunt him and overcome him almost like an addiction. He stated he felt that he could not fight the feeling and wondered if in fact the devil had anything to do with his evil thoughts. He states because of this, he watched the movie Exorcist 2 almost on a daily, weekly basis for approximately six months, sometimes two to three times a week. He states in the movie he could tell that the devil was angry for being condemned and that he could relate with the devil because he felt that his life on earth was condemned. He went on to state that the main character in the movie, movie appeared to be driven by evil and that he could relate to this character as felt that his life was driven by evil. It was questioned regarding the heads which he had kept in his apartment. He asked, it was asked how in fact he got the brain matter out of the skulls and why the skulls looked so completely clean and dried when they were discovered. He states after killing his victims and decapitating them, he would use a small drill to drill several holes in various areas of the head and then boil the head. 
He stated during the boiling process, he would use a large plastic syringe, which he had purchased at Lee's Hardware, and he would fill the syringe with Soylex cleansing solution and boiling water, and inject the solution into the holes which he had previously drilled in the heads. He stated this solution would help turn the brain matter into a mushy substance, and after approximately one hour of boiling, the upper vertebrae located in the neck area would become loose and he could dislodge them. He states at this time he would use a large serving spoon or utensil to dig into the back part of the skull and scoop out the brain matter which had turned to mush. After scooping out the brain matter and discarding it in the toilet, he would again place the skull in the boiling water and boil it until thoroughly until it was completely clear of any flesh, hair, mucus, or brain matter. This time he was asked why he kept the heads and in fact he considered them to be a trophy. He stated he did not consider them trophies. However, he wanted to keep the skulls of his victims because to him the skull represented the true essence of his victims. Let me just stop you there. Detective Kennedy, according to his reports, asked him if he considered them trophies. He said he did not consider them trophies. Right. He considered them the true essence of his victims. Yes. Continue, please. He stated he felt that by at least keeping the heads, the death of his victims would not be a total loss because the heads would be with him. He stated he eventually planned to paint all the skulls in order to keep them from being detected. However, he never got around to doing this. At this time, Mr. Dahmer stated, it's hard now, for me. When, as you start here now, this is in quotes, so it's a direct quote. It's hard. Yeah. Go ahead. He stated in quotations, it's hard for me to believe that a human being could have done what I've done, but I don't, but I know that I did it. I want you to understand that my questions regarding Satan and the devil were not to diffuse guilt from me or blame the devil for what I've done, because I realize that what I've done is my guilt but I have to question whether or not there is an evil force in the world or whether or not I have been influenced by it. And whether or not I have been influenced by it. Right. Go ahead. Although I am not sure if there is a God or if there is a devil, I know that as of lately, I've been, been doing a lot of thinking about both and I have to wonder what this influenced me in my life, what has influenced me in my life. That's the end of the quote. Yes. Go ahead. Mr. Dharma was then asked if there were any other victims that he had neglected to tell us about, at which time he stated, quote, Pat, what good, what good would it do for me to admit to just half of my victims or to a few of my victims or to not tell you of a couple when I know that in the long run it will be me that has to stand before God and admit to my wrongdoings and he'll know if I was truthful and honest when I finally was caught. And if I help to try and clear this whole matter up, I'm telling you the truth now because I want to clear my conscious, conscience. And all that I've told you is the truth, and I'm not, I've not left anything out. End of quote. End of quote. And then that was the end of that interview. That's correct. The next time uh, that uh, you gentlemen speak with him is uh, when Mr. Kennedy does. Correct? Right. And that has to do with the instance in Ohio and information about that. Correct? Yes, with the Ohio officers. Is, is, there, is there anything that we learn in that interview that's different than what we already know to be the fact? Why don't you read it so we don't... Uh, um. Detective Kennedy met with Lieutenant Muncie and Detective Karabatsis from Ohio and questioned uh, Mr. Dahmer regarding the Ohio incident and also questioned him regarding uh, a large black traveler's trunk which Mr. Dahmer had kept in a basement locked at his grandmother's house in West Dallas. He related that this was a trunk which he had used from the time he left the military service in order to travel by placing all his worldly goods in it. The reason he kept his trunk locked while at his grandmother's house was because it was this trunk that he placed all his pornographic materials, including magazines and videotapes, which he purchased. 
He stated the trunk was locked because he did not wish his grandmother to discover that he was involved in viewing and reading pornographic material. Regarding information pertaining to the barbell, which had been mentioned in previous reports that Mr. Dahmer used to choke his victim in Bath, Ohio, officers reported that they recovered a barbell set from the suspect's father. They inquired as to whether or not this was the one used to commit the offense, which time Mr. Dahmer related he used one of the dumbbells, which is a smaller handheld set of dumbbells, which he would use independently of the other barbells in the set. Again, reiterated that when the victim told him he was going to leave, he struck him while he was sitting in a chair with the barbell. He then stated he used the barbell to choke the victim to death. Okay. Lieutenant Muncy uh, had also uh, was talking to Mr. Dahmer and had advised him of his rights, and Mr. Dahmer waived those, correct? Yes. Okay. I would like you to go to the end of page 135 and just uh, we'll end, we'll end uh, with that page and just a sh couple more paragraphs and for the morning recess and tell us about picking up on the discussion uh, concerning the showing of photos of Mr. Dahmer of one of his victims. At this time, he spoke again with the suspect regarding the second victim at his grandmother's house. If this victim as of date, as of this date, had not been positively identified. Mr. Dahmer again viewed a photo array and picked out a photo of James E. Docksitter. He related that this photo was possibly that of the victim in question. He related that the hair is about the same. However, the photo appears to show the victim to be a bit too young. This time he was questioned as to whether or not he can remember anything regarding the victim which would help in an investigation, meaning tattoos or scars, deformities or anything. And Mr. Dahmer related that he was not sure but the victim could have had a slight or quite faded scar on his stomach or groin area, possibly that of an appendix removal or a hernia operation. He related that although he is not completely positive, that it seem, he seems to remember that during the time of this offense, as he cut open this victim, it occurred to him that the victim possibly had only one kidney. He rated he is not completely sure of this. However, he seems to remember that upon removing the internal organs of the, his victim, it, it did not appear that all of his internal organs were there. He further related he remembers the victim being almost as tall as himself, possibly 5'10 or 5'11, with dark curly hair, medium length, and remembers the victim stating he lived in the area of 10th and National. When the victim mentioned that he had returned to his mother's house in that area earlier in the morning, this is when Mr. Dahmer decided to kill him. Mr. Dahmer recalled the possibility of the victim having a tattoo on one of his arms, but he is not sure it's possible. He cannot really remember. Mr. Dahmer was question regarding any further information in order to help make an identification of this individual, but he could not offer any at this time, and the interview was completed. Okay. Your Honor, I think it's a good time to stop, and I would like to, to inform the court with the approval of counsel that when we do reconvene, I'm going to interrupt the continuation of this to call one or two witnesses and then to ask uh, Detective Murphy then to return to the stand for the continuation of what I think is probably another hour of hour and a half of testimony. Okay. I, I think maybe I should explain that we're breaking a little bit early. The reason we're breaking early is because Detective Murphy is required in another courtroom to give testimony in, an, uh, in another case. And one of the things that's been going on this morning, there have been some adjust, uh, adjustments going on in time. And we were originally going to break at 1130, and then we got word from the other court that they would uh, really accommodate us by uh, taking Detective Murphy a little later. So one thing I'd like to do is thank Judge Geske for uh, helping out in that regard. Another thing, I mentioned when we first came in that I had some uh, uh, earlier calendar, and there were a couple of cases that were going to have to wait till 1130. One of those cases has been taken by my colleague, Judge Mannion, so I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, that help. The other one has been put over to another day, so we don't have it, that problem. We do have this problem. At 1 o'clock, I've directed the lawyers to be back here, and we have some legal matters to take care of.
So while court will be going back in session at one o'clock, we won't be uh, requiring your attendance until probably about 1.30 or so. Anyways, court's in recess. Let's have a good lunch hour. All right, please.